request the countdown video. Um, good evening, everyone. Are we audible? Please uh, type in the comments if you can hear me. This is that. Are we audible? Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first webinar causery hosted by the Department of English, St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. Professor Shripali Matthew today will be speaking about the various kinds of realities through an exploration of the Calvin and Hobbes comics. Professor Shripali is an alumna of St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. She completed her UG here and then went on to do her master's in English at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. Currently, she teaches English and creative writing at St. Joseph's College. I am Bupanita Mukherjee, uh, a second year MA English student at Joseph's, and I will be moderating this course. Before we continue, um, I'd like to notify the audience that they can leave their questions in the YouTube chat box and we will address them during the Q&A round. Over to you, Shifali Ma'am. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. Give me a second. OK, yes. Uh, yeah. OK. So um, the title for this uh, causery is Calvin and Hobbes, Real, Not Real. It's actually a reference to The Hunger Games. Um, I'm not talking about The Hunger Games here, but I decided to reference The Hunger Games anyway. And uh, that's Calvin saying, uh, reality continues to ruin my life. OK, so uh, I'll just get started. Um, when you're a kid, a lot of things seem real to you, right? And one of the things that seemed real to you is your toys. So Christopher Robin had Winnie the Pooh. Calvin had Hobbes. And I had a doll named Rosie. Rosie was an orange doll. Her skin wasn't orange. Her skin was actually gray because she was really dirty. And her dress was orange. Her shoes were orange. Her hat was orange. Her hair was orange. And she had lost her eyes and her mouth. She was a very ugly doll, and I loved her with everything that I was. Now, one day, somebody told me that uh, Rosie was not real because she didn't have a heart, and only things that had hearts were real. And this really upset me. I think I bit him, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so over here, I'm going to be talking about reality and what is real. I'm making an assumption that everything is real when I say that what is real because, um, you know, we could all just be fictional characters. But 
assuming that everything is real, there is the reality that we all are a part of, and that's our shared reality. But there's also the reality that goes on in my head or in my or in my body. So if my toe is itching, that's my personal reality. So we're simultaneously existing in more than one reality. Also, uh, before I continue, I'm going to say the word reality like a ton of times, so I'm apologizing now. So um, books and movies present to us another form of reality. And most people would say that the reality which is real is our shared reality, because that's what all of us experience. But I'd argue that everything is real, even that of books and movies, right? Um, now, comics are slightly different because they don't present you with the full reality. And I'll explain what I mean using this comic from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. So you have this picture here of a man screaming, now you die. And then you just have a landscape with someone screaming, right? You don't know that the murder has happened. You haven't seen the murder happen. But you've assumed that it does. You've taken these two pictures and placed them together to make a story in your head. You have made your own reality. Um, so Scott McCloud calls a gap between the two panels the gutter. And he says that in the, in the limbo of the gutter, your imagination takes two separate images and makes them into one single idea. So he has this lovely um, description, so I'm just going to read that. An equal partner in crime known as the reader. I may have drawn an axe being raised in this example, but I am not the one who let it drop or decided how hard the blow or who screamed or why. That, dear reader, was your special crime. Each of you, all of you participated in the murder. All of you held the axe and showed your spot. Now, this is kind of terrifying, but it's also really beautiful because it means that we are actively participating in the story. Without us, there is no story. And I think that's amazing. Um, now, when we come to Calvin and Hobbes, the idea of reality becomes even more complicated because you are presented with two realities. There's the reality that Calvin sees in which Hobbes is a live tiger. And then there's the reality that everyone else sees in which Hobbes is just a toy. And we presented both of these in one single strip. Um, Kira Lyle says that uh, Watson, because it's a comic, Watson can show these two realities side by side. He doesn't have to um, say, OK, now Hobbes is a tiger, a live tiger, and now Hobbes is an inanimate object. He can present both of these together at the same time. So it's split into two realities. and. We're told if we want, we can make our choice. We can choose to believe that Hobbes is a live tiger, or we can choose to believe that he is a toy. But what I love about Calvin and Hobbes is that we don't have to make that choice. Um, so Kira Lyle again says that um, it's not Calvin's reality is not depicted as a thought or as a dream sequence. We take given two different sometimes opposing views of reality, and they're put together, but we don't know which one is primary. And Watterson actually talks about this. He says that he doesn't think of Hobbes as a doll that comes to, miraculously comes to life when Calvin's around. He sees Hobbes, neither does he see Hobbes as a product of Calvin's imagination. So Hobbes's reality doesn't interest him. Calvin sees Hobbes one way, and everyone else sees Hobbes another way. He just shows two versions of reality, and both are equally true. So uh, I had to bring in a Harry Potter quote, because it's Harry Potter, and I love Harry Potter. So um, this is from Dumbledore. Of course it's happening in your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it is not real? We are simultaneously part of many different realities. We're part of the shared reality that we're all experienced together, our personal reality, my toe is scratching, the reality of every book, every movie I've read or watched. Um, and so this small comic, it shows um, Calvin. Uh, so there are two meanings of the word stuffed in this comic, right? There's 
Calvin's mother's meaning of the word stuffed, in which it means that Hobbes is a toy. But there's also Calvin's meaning of the word stuffed, which is that Hobbes ate Tommy Chestnut. Uh, I found this strip particularly interesting because Calvin's mother is crying while she cuts onions. And Calvin asks her, why are you crying? And she says, I'm cutting an onion. And he says, it must be hard to cook if you anthropomorphize your vegetables. Which is ironic because, in a way, isn't Calvin anthropomorphizing Hobbes? Um, so the thing is, when your imagination is reality, like if you believe that every time you're cutting an onion, so it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. You have friends that, I, I have a twin brother who's being raised by giraffes. Um, it's a long story. But, and it's wonderful having him around. But um, it's also horrifying. If you think that every time you're cutting an onion, you're killing it, that's scary. I used to be worried about people hurting the feelings of the floor because of the way people would walk on it and trample on it and pay no respect to it. I used to be worried that my toys would think that I loved Rosie more than them. I'm still worried about that. And uh, in fact, once I gave one of my toys away to someone and for days I cried and cried because I was so upset with the fact that the poor toy would think that I didn't love it as much as I loved my other toys, which was not true. So when imagination is reality, um, it creates monsters, right? And in, a, in Calvin's world, often those monsters are adults, which is an interesting thing to notice, but I'm not gonna read too deeply into it either. Um, however, what I love about this, about imagination is that even if it's, you know, even if you see monsters everywhere, Neil Gaiman says that fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. And this is one of my favorite quotes, because Calvin here is battling the Bart monster, but he wins the battle. Um, in, in this comic, uh, he creates a city and then he destroys the city. He becomes the god of small things. He's got a world which he can control. And it's his imagination which allows him to do this because his imagination is reality. So I'd like to argue that when we read a book or a comic, we are given back our childhood. And I'm not saying that this is childish because many comics and graphic novels are related, and you know, manga for instance, lots of them are rated unsuitable for children. But in giving us the fear and the love and all that wonder that you have when you read something, you are getting your childhood back because imagination becomes reality. It allows you to be anyone or anything. It can, you can be an elephant, you can be a dinosaur, you can be an ant. But why comics? And I think the answer to this is that comics allow us with a sort of active participation. So a friend of mine talks about how when she reads a book, there's a reel going on in her head. In Calvin and Hobbes and in all comics, you are both provided with this reel and denied it. When you watch a movie, the reel goes on in front of you and there's no breaks in between. When you read a book, the reel is in your head. In the comics, you're just provided with pictures which you piece together. And I think that's pretty brilliant. Okay, I'm almost at the end. Um, so there, this is a famous um, picture and it's supposed to show you the treachery of image, images. So it says that this is not a pipe because, you know, it's, the image, it's an image of a pipe, it's not actually a pipe. But the thing is, I think that in a world where 
you know, a live tiger, a tiger can be best friends with a boy. A doll can have a heart and can love. And that the sky can be a million different colors at the same time. This can be a pipe. That's about all I have to present. Hi, Dipanta. Thank you, ma'am, for that presentation. Uh, for those of you who are just joining in, uh, we are talking about rea reality and the various kinds of reality uh, through Calvin and Hobbes comics. And we were also, ma'am, also was talking about how. Um, Imagination can be reality, and it is a way of revisiting our childhood. So um, the audience can uh, leave their questions in the chat box. We will take them up in the Q&A session. Uh, so ma'am, um, so, so this paper was published in the um, International Journal of Comic Art. And uh, I want to ask you about the process of sort of writing this paper, the process of coming up with this topic. And uh, the like, why did you think that Calvin and Hobbes would be the best comic to sort of um, explore this reality and multiple realities? Okay, so this started as a presentation I was doing for class. Okay, and as soon as we were told we had to make a presentation, I knew I was going to do it on. I was going to do it on Death Note. Okay, <laughs> and I wanted to do it on the idea of power and how power corrupts, and. I took lots of notes and I tried to make it into a presentation and it didn't happen. Nothing was happening. And I realized that what I really wanted to do it on was something childish, like something childhood related. And that's, I realized that that's not the best when you're thinking of academic things, but I didn't care. I wanted to do it this way. So I found, um, I immediate, I found this quote by Bill Watterson, the one which I projected in which he talks about how he doesn't, he shows two versions of reality at the same time. And that fascinated me. And I realized as I was looking at it that there are so many different types of reality. We all experience reality in many different ways. And so um, that's how it came to me. Uh, it was, yeah, it kind of came all in one go. It wasn't very, like, I didn't think very hard about it. Um, thank you, ma'am. So you were talking about how the uh, uh, academic, um, yeah. how first the presentation. Yeah, can you not hear me? No, now I can hear you, now I can hear you. Talking about how it began as a presentation and then sort of evolved into the paper. So, was there a kind of um, challenge that was posed with this academic research type language when you were talking about comics? Okay, so um, the thing is, I'm not the greatest at academic language, but um, so what I did instead was I tried to make the paper so that. I would be interested to read it, right? I don't know if anyone else would be interested to read it, but I wanted it to be that so that I would like reading it so that it made editing easier. And I remember talking to my brother about it when, um, just before I wrote it, and uh, we sort of, he helped me figure out what exactly, he's doing medicine, he's not doing English, but he helped me figure out what I was going to do. Um, and yeah, it was the language was did not come difficult was not difficult because I was writing in a way I wanted to write. And I was writing about something I wanted to write about. I realized that I'm not I'm not good at writing about things I find boring. Sometimes you have to do that, but I realized I'm not very good at it. And so while I'm willing to do that at times, when I can, I like to write about something I find interesting. And that's how this happened. Yeah, same. Uh, I'm not very good <laughs> at <laughs> writing about things I don't, I'm not interested in. Um, so you were talking about the active participant and how the comics make the reader uh, 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 very active in the reading process. Um, 
so this reminded me of something that i studied about in like my first semester uh we were talking about roland barthes's two kinds of um, texts one was the read early texts and the other is the write early texts so the read early text is is a very like that real thing you mentioned where the where the reader is just sitting back and passively consuming the text which is essentially the product of the author whereas the write early text is where the reader has to sort of sort of step up and um establish meaning through his own um interpretation and it's not it's it's sort of like a resistance to this very stable process of of the passive reading and um an example would be um this book that we read called aunt julia and the script writer by mario vargas llosa where it had alternate chapters where and the odd numbered chapters had the main protagonist storyline which was essentially a coming of age story of this writer and his like love affair and the odd number chapters sorry the even number chapters was um uh, re- these radio serials radio episodes written by a script writer called pedro camacho and as the story progressed pedro camacho's um uh, me- sort of mental mental stability deteriorated and everything sort of became confusing and the reader had to piece the main story line back together the the the, the radio episodes back together and um it was very it was a very interrupted process the reading wasn't just you know this one continuous continuity of a reel it was very interrupted very jammed by these alternate story lines so uh, that reminded me of the active participant bit so do you think because you talked about comics also requiring this kind of piecing together um by the reader uh, do you think all comics could be writerly texts Okay I'm not sure if I'm correct here but I definitely think so um because you're not given the full picture you are given two different pictures and you place them together to make the real right speaking about aunt julia and the script writer um so there's another book like that and I didn't realize the similarity until um Arusa pointed it out during the graphic novel conference that um so it's called fan girl and i had read this book long ago but i hadn't realized the connection she writes fan fiction in every alternate chapter right and um so the fan fiction and uh, it's fan fiction in every alternate chapter and it's her story every other chapter and um i think it's interesting when people do things like this because it sort of makes your well not exactly an unreliable narrator but slightly if you know what i mean and i think unreliable narrators are the most reliable types of narrators because if you you can i don't know anybody who can tell a story reliably right and um yeah also this so i had i asked this question to um i take a class on writing children and i asked them how they would um break the fourth wall if you're writing a story how would you break the fourth wall sort of and someone had this lovely example of how they'd um make readers choose where they wanted to go and that's also an example of active participation i think like you you can decide okay now i want to uh i don't know jump into the car or now i want to hide behind the bush like that i think those are all examples of active participation Thank you ma'am. Uh I'd like to remind the audience again to please leave their questions in the YouTube chat box. Um we will take them up very shortly. Um so one last question before we move on to the Q&A. Uh, I was reading this book by Gia Tolentino called uh, Trick Mirror and it's um a collection of essays. The first essay she's talking about the internet and she she speaks of the self as an as a performance. um in the online space and how we are constantly having to perform ourselves on the internet so what do you think of this performance aspect is is does this also consider um this has also become part of our personal and shared reality um because this is something that we are actively sort of orchestrating to be seen to be viewed by an audience instead of experiencing something um so yeah reality and performance 
online? <laughs> so that's a very good question, and I'm sure I'm going to mess up the answer. Um, okay, so uh, okay. So when you put yourself on the internet, you're projecting a certain personality, right? And this personality may not be the person you are when you're talking to your friends or when you're at home. But I'd say that even if you're projecting a personality, that is part of who you are. I think that each of us is made of many personalities, if you will. There are many parts to us. Um, I'm going to quote Kiara from Lion King 2 here. Uh, I'm, not just, uh, I'm not just the princess. That's just part of who I am. Okay? Um, so we're all made of different parts. So for example, um, there is small talk Shefali. Shefali who talks to strangers. And she feels fake lots of the time. But she really isn't because she's also part of who Shefali is, right? And um, yeah, I think it's, if you, there's a quote, I can't remember the exact words, but basically, if you pretend to be someone long enough, you become that person. And I think it's a little more complicated than that because if you pretend to be someone long enough, you become, that's one part of the person you are. So the thing about the internet is often you either protect yourself as, you know, being really nice when you may not be, or you may be protecting yourself as being, um, you know, really, there's some view you really believe in when you don't actually believe in it. And I think after a while, you'd start believing in it. And also, um, like, I think that you can choose to be anyone you want on the internet. So the best thing to do is to carefully choose who you want to be. That's what I would say, I think. Thank you, ma'am. So with this, with this, we'll open it up to the audience now. Um, and Maria Sebastian is asking, how long was the paper and did you use any theoretical framework to work on the paper map? Okay. How long was the paper? Uh, I think it was 3,500 words. Uh, so it was not a very long paper. Um, did I use any theory? I did not. I. This paper sort of just happened. It was very strange because I didn't think too hard about it. I didn't think, OK, I'm going to use this way of doing it. The paper just happened. And I only sent it because I was sure it would get rejected. So um, you know, it was a real surprise when it got accepted. Um, Ajay Chandran is asking, is the paper available online? No, the paper is not available online. I'm sorry. Um, Harshita uh, is asking, uh, I'm curious about how you think about Hobbes' view of reality and how he sees himself at, and Calvin and everyone else. Oh, that's a lovely question. OK, so how does Hobbes see everyone else? And how does Hobbes see himself? Um, OK, so I'm going to think of Rosie here. What would Rosie think? Did Rosie think? I think Rosie taught. OK, OK, no, not Rosie, Shadow. Shadow is my dog. Shadow, he's not an inanimate object, but he definitely taught very highly of himself. And I think, I think Hobbes is a lot like Shadow in a way. He also thinks, definitely thinks he's real. And I think the idea that other people don't notice how great he is in a way, it's, it's not that he looks down on them for that, but he, um, he, there's one point where he says that your parents wanted another tiger, not another child, wanted a tiger, not a child, right? So I think he sees himself as being a pretty cool person. And I agree, I really like Hobbes. Um, and also I really like my dog. And I'm only now realizing there's a similarity between them, but there is. So I think he sees himself as cool and 
other people as interesting, slightly strange, but not as um, cool as him. I'm just basing this on my dog, though it's, it's a lot of projection happening right here. Um, there's a response that could also be taken as a question mm -hmm. from Saranya VS. So um, they are saying that uh, comics do limit the possibility of visual construction and imagination, and it affects the, the active participation from the reader. Okay, I'm not sure I understood. Can you read that again, please? So they are saying that comics do comics limit the possibility of visual construction and imagination. Is it because um, Saranya, would you like to please rephrase the question or add something more to it? And then we can get back to it. Um, so Suchitra Maurya, Suchita Maurya um, asks, do you think comics should be allegorical always? What are your views? Oh, wow. OK. Um, no. I don't think anything has to be allegorical always. Um, because I don't think that's how the world works. I don't know. That's not a great answer, but yeah. So Arul sir is asking, oh. Calvin's, <laughs> Calvin's alter egos seem to offer a living history of genres of popular American fiction. Hmm. Man, Spiff, and so on. Um, would love to hear what you make of the work these figures do in the comic strip. Okay, so one of the interesting things about all of those is that um, when he's fighting the villains, like I said, they're often the adult. Um, I think it's. I think Watterson is an incredibly smart person. Okay. So when he uses, um, you know, people like the movies that we've seen to tell a story that it's sort of is in between this reality of, it, it mixes realities together. You've got Calvin's reality, you've got the reality of the movie, you've got the reality of um, yourself. And Calvin is going through this process of living another world. And that's what, so uh, for the longest time when I read a story, I'd imagine myself being in the story and not an, an observer. I'd imagine, so if Artemis Fowl was doing something stupid, I'd be telling him, Artemis, you're doing something stupid, don't do this. So I think that's a little like what Calvin is doing. He finds himself in other worlds and he's an active participant in that world. Um, okay, Acha Sankau is asking, although Calvin and Hobbes is believed to be a children's comic, do you think Watterson was actually using the child's perspective to be satirical or comment on the society? Okay, so that's a good question. But I'm going to apply this to all children's literature. I think no children's literature was actually made for children. It was every piece of children's literature that I've read at least is smart, makes a comment on society, is satirical, um, tells you things that you wouldn't realize. So one of my favorite quotes is something that is from Winnie the Pooh and it's something that keeps me get like gets me going. Uh, it says, always remember that you are braver than you believe, smarter than you think and stronger than you seem. And this is a children's book. It's so it is something you tell children, you know, you have to remember you're brave and all that. But it's also very wise, right? And I think a lot of children's books are wise. And I love children's literature. It's my favorite genre. Um, I think that there's so much wisdom in children's literature. And so I think adults should read children's literature. Um, C.S. Lewis says, when you are old enough, you will read fairy tales again. And I agree with him. 
Yeah, definitely agree. Um, Sonia J. Nair is asking, could Hobbes be a defense mechanism that we all long for to combat loneliness? Um, would Hobbes be perceived as a schizophrenic trigger? Oh, wow. Psychology. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, could Hobbes be perceived as a schizophrenic trigger? Mm. Well, a defense mechanism, I, I don't know if I'd agree with that because um, I wouldn't call it a def defense mechanism or a schizophrenic figure because I think we all do it at some level and I don't think it's a defense mechanism so much as a desire to see other worlds, see people in things. And yes, that may be called schizophrenic, may be called um, a lot of things. But I think that it's, I think it's beautiful actually that he's able to imagine that his toy is real. Um, there are like, there are people who say that, um, well, what was that? Winnie the Pooh is the seven deadly sins, I think. And um, I wouldn't agree with that, even though I understand where they're coming from. Because I think they're just people who are people with faults. And I think they're adorable. And so I'm just very passionate about children's literature. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, the se she has also added on to her question, um, Sonia. She's asking, uh, how do you compare the worlds of Calvin and Hobbes to the interior world inhabited by Dilbert? Oh, I actually haven't read the Dilbert comics. So I cannot really answer that. I'm so sorry. Um, so Sham, Shams. Uh, has a question. Uh, what about Thomas Hobbes and John Calvin's shadows in the comics? Uh, okay, so so I think it's interesting that um, Watson decided to name these two characters after philosophers because um, it's something that even Lemony Snicket does, Daniel Handler, he does when he names um, the Baudelaire's uh, children after Charles Baudelaire, right? Um, I think that for one thing, he's showing that children are wiser than they seem. And we often see this because Kazan will say like very, very wise statements. And so there's a definite philosophy like a line of philosophy going through all the craziness that is Calvin and Hobbes. So the actual Calvin and Hobbes definitely have some say in what's happening to the fictional but real Calvin and Hobbes. Um, Mutro Kumar is asking, uh, what about comics that do not use panels but stream of pictures? Um, can they make the reader an active participant as well? Okay, so even if it's a stream of pictures, you're not seeing it as, um, like, it's not like a movie where, I, like, okay, if I raise my hand like this, you see each part of my hand being raised. It happens, it's first down here and then it's up here. So you still have to piece together something. Um, Shri Parvati uh, has a question about, do you think there is relation between common man and Hobbes? Since common man, um, although present, seems to be as invisible as Hobbes is in the comic. That's an interesting question. Common man as in just normal people. 
it's I think it's it's a reference to um, something because it, it's been capitalized. It's common oh, man. common man, as in the uh, the comics. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, is is there a relationship between them? Perhaps. Um, I've never thought of it. Um. Hom does not appear in front of people. Common man also is not seen in front of people. Yes, perhaps there is a relationship. That's a very interesting thing to notice. I never, I never thought of it. Um, Kartik Balram is asking: Are there any political interpretations associated or inflicted upon the comic? Okay, I don't know of any, but I'm certain there are. Everything has political implications. Um, as one of my professors says, all is political. Um, there is. I I don't know the political uh, uh, implications of the Calvin and Hobbes, but I have no doubt that there are many political implications of them. Uh, Jasmine Fernandez um, is asking about the gap that you mentioned in comics. uh different from other literary genres uh is she talking about the gutter or i think so okay so the gutter is basically the space between two panels in a comic right and um other literary genres don't have that so much because we go from one word to the next and that's how the story flows you need a flow maybe stories like um aunt hulia and the script writer and fan girl actually do provide a gap because they um change between chapters i don't know if i've understood this question correctly but um but yeah i think that that's how the gap is different in normal fiction not normal fiction in prose fiction i'm not sure what to call non comics in non comics and comics Uh, Megha Nayar uh, is asking, do you think Calvin is like a grown man living in a child's body because he tends to get very philosophical at times? I think children are very philosophical. Um, I think you say a lot more wise things when you're a child than when you say when you're an adult. Uh, I can't think of an example now, but I was much wiser as a child than I am now, and I'm much more childish now than I was when I was a child. I think my childhood self would be very disappointed in me because he'd be like what are you doing jumping around and singing to ponies or I don't know I don't know what I'm doing but yeah yeah um TG TG Shinoy is um saying does Calvin himself ever realize that Hobbes is not a real tiger um Or rather, is there any strip in which Calvin considers Hobbes as a toy? I don't think there's any strip in which Calvin considers Hobbes as a toy because Hobbes is live to Calvin, and he is real. I don't think that there it, there needs to be a realization that he's not that he is a toy because he is real. And um, however, there are like. fan made cartoons in which they have calvin as older and him giving hobbs to his daughter and his daughter talking to hobbs and calvin can no longer hear hobbs which is both sad and beautiful at the same time but i don't think watterson has ever done this um So Indu Ramesh is asking uh, about fairy tales, and in fairy tales, is the femininity in children um, made passive or stereotyped? I'm not sure if I understood the question. Um, if you can rephrase it, Indu Indu Ramesh, uh, we will we will take it up. Um, just we will take it up later. Um, Saranya V S. So, so she was the one who. Um, yes, yes. From earlier, uh, comics are more into a mode of illustrations or art sequences. So, do you find that as 
a limitation for an active participation from readers okay so um one thing that some people say is that books are better than movies because books you imagine everything and movies um it's given to you right but and i used to think this until like join josephs and um i remember talking to arusa about it and he said so why do you think that um books are better than movies and i said because there's more imagination and i don't think that's true i think even in movies there's a lot of scope for imagination it's just a different type you, yes you know what the, the people look like but your imagination goes beyond the actual story right it goes beyond what happens in the movie um so i'd often when i watched anime as a kid i'd often imagine if adventures which i went on with those characters so yes it's art and art is presented to us but we are not seeing the movements we are not seeing a lot of things that make the story real to us that happens in our head um sham is also asking about the cultural references uh in the calvin and hobbes comics i feel like i should know this but i uh there is ref- there are references to movies there are references to philosophers but i can't think of any one right now i'm afraid sorry um acha sankhav is asking do you think calvin and hobbes would be impactful enough if it was not a comic and was presented as a story um because the gutter in a way allows you to create another reality so you're asking if would it be more impactful if it was um not a comic okay i think comics are very impactful the problem is that most people think that it's for children and because of that they don't read it and i think we've got to put this behind us that this idea that we will not read what is for children because i think children's stories have so much wisdom um and so i definitely think so it may have been more popular if it wasn't a comic there may have been more people reading it i don't know but i definitely think a comic is the ideal medium for bill watterson to do what he does but to tell a story with two realities and to show both the realities as equally real i think that's something that can only be done in a comic as well um ko zevier uh, has a question about how would calvin and hobbes be received in with the indian parents um in a radically different society than uh, the west how would parenting how would these standards of parenting reading of calvin and hobbes that's a very interesting question um so i think if an in calvin is very very uh what's the word i'm looking for i'm the word that's coming to my head is boisterous but that's not the word i want to use he very energetic a little too messy and i think indian parents may have a problem with this but at the same time i don't think indian parents are that different from parents okay i'm saying something very controversial now i don't think they're that different from parents in the west in one way because but i'm just talking from my my experience my parents are i think they're fine with calvin and hobbes and they're fine with me being a little crazy and so i don't know how like other people would react to it but it would be so cool if we had a comic like calvin and hobbes for indians like with an indian child who was um you know having who had i don't know a toy anything an elephant perhaps because my my cousin had a toy elephant named anna so if if you had a if you, and it could be a girl yes a girl child with a toy elephant that would be amazing uh so indu ramesh from earlier has rephrased the question the women characters in fairy tales are portrayed as passive and stereotyped does it give a negative impact on children 
Um, okay. So one thing is, I think it irritates me as a grown-up more than it irritated me as a child to see uh, female characters portrayed as being passive. And I think it is a problem having them being portrayed as passive, which is why I think a lot of people are trying to fix that now. That's why you have, you have, um, you know, you have Mulan, for instance. I know everyone says Frozen's the best, but for me, it's Mulan. Um, and you do have people trying to fix this. Fairy tales, I love fairy tales. I, I'm going to put that out. I love fairy tales, but they are problematic. There are many problems with fairy tales. And so, um, yes, it's a problem for children to see stories in which, you know, it's always a white, beautiful girl who never never um, reacts to anything. Like in Cinderella, she never tells her stepmother, you know what, I'm not doing this. But at the same time, people are fixing it. There's this lovely, um, it's not a retelling, it's an actual, it's not a fairy tale either, but it's like a fairy tale, it's based on fairy tales, called The Ordinary Princess. And it's about this girl, this princess who is born as beautiful as, uh, she's the seven daughter, so she's born the most beautiful person in the land. And, her, and people come to her for, um, the fairies come to grant her gifts, like in Sleeping Beauty. And they, one, finally the most powerful fairy comes and she gives her the gift of being ordinary. And I, love this book. It's one of my favorite books in the world because I think it's very important that children see ordinary people in their stories. Ordinary, show that it's ordinary people who can do great things. Or don't do great things. That's also fine. Uh, Arun Mani sir has another question. Um, so another with a surreal life featuring alternate personalities is Snoopy. Uh, Red Baron Snoopy never actually speaks. Wonder what you make of these two details together in connection to Calvin and Hobbes. Okay, so I haven't read much of Snoopy actually. Um, let's see. Can you repeat the question once, sorry, Panta? Sure. Um, Another example of uh, surreal life featuring alternate personalities is Snoopy. Red Baron Snoopy, for example, never actually speaks. Wonder what you make of these two details together in connection to Calvin and Hobbes. Okay. Um, so, Snoopy never speaking in relation to Calvin and Hobbes. Okay, well. <laughs> um, okay. So, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin Hobbes has well, Calvin has many personalities, right? He's he does this, and sometimes he's a monster, and sometimes he's a dinosaur, and sometimes he's an ant. I, I never answered why he wanted to be an ant. Um, but Snoopy, I think, I think that's just how things are. We ha have many personalities. I'm not sure if I'm answering this question correctly because I don't know much about Snoopy. But we all have many personalities within us. And so, um, so I'm sure that there's a Shafali somewhere that doesn't talk at all. I know that, I, I, not I'm sure, I, I've, I've witnessed her, she exists, she, she just sits in silent, con like everyone else will be talking and she'll just sit there and not say a word. So I think it's just that we have many people within us. Um, Sheba Serlin um, is asking about the influence of power. Uh, do you think Disney movies influence kids with the thought that power is the greatest thing, um, even though it's portrayed as an evil thing? Example, Jafar. Hmm, that's a very interesting question because we are shown that everyone wants power, everyone wants um you know, Ursula wants to be queen. Uh, Cecilia wants to be the ruler of the town or the world. I can't remember. 
yeah, it, it definitely shows you that power is something that is desirable, but it also shows you that power is only wanted for, like, only villains want it, which I do not think is true. Um, I think that there are people who who are ambitious and who are not, who definitely are not banned. Um, so I think that, and I, so I think that actually showing power as being a bad thing may not be the greatest thing, but showing a want for power, which can be destructive, then you're teaching children that power is, that sort of power is wrong. Cause that is wrong. Wanting to be so powerful that you don't care what happens to anyone else. Um, so, Antelin Shalu is, um, has a question about the Marvel comic series. And um, they're saying that, what are your thoughts about the Marvel comics? Um, and it is considered to be more progressive than any other comics, according to Antelin. So, so I'm going to make a confession here. I have not read many Marvel comics. I love the movies. I'm a terrible person. I, you know, you're not supposed to say you love the movies and haven't read the comics, but I, that is true for me. I've read very few of the comics. Um, I think that they are quite progressive, actually. They're, um, you have Captain Marvel, who is a woman, and I think that's important. So the most powerful of the Avengers, if you will, is a woman. Um, you have uh, Gamora, who is from another planet. So I think it does show us that people are different and people are, and minorities are there and minorities are important. Uh, yeah, I think the Marvel comics are quite progressive. And I love Marvel, like the movies. I feel very ashamed for saying that, but yeah. Okay, so uh, this will be the last question uh, that we'll take. This is from Hemant John. Um, he's asking, uh, sometimes Calvin thought his parents presented poor performances as parents. Do you think this is Calvin's naive viewpoint about grown-ups being uninteresting or on a more philosophic note about parents not having time for children anymore? Oh, it could be both, actually. Uh, it's, it's very amusing when he gives them those grade sheets and he's just like, you got a D at being a parent. If you do this, you'll get an A. Um, okay, I never gave my parents grade sheets. I probably would have given them very high marks. But uh, I can... See, in Calvin's case, he is both... His parents are not completely understanding of how crazy he is. At the same time, I think they try, they do love him, which I still think is the basis of good relationships, um, that you love each other. So I would not give Calvin's parents as low grades as he's given them. At the same time, maybe they don't understand him well enough. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the comics, it does a very good job of portraying these two worlds, right? As you said, the adult world and the children's world. And very often as a child, the, the boundaries between the reality and, you know, something that's fantasy is, is very blurred. And um, there is a certain, so, so there is like, that's why I think it, it requires uh, the use of comics and multiple realities to show what the adult world is seeing as real and what the child is seeing as real, and both are valid. Uh, so thank you, Shafali, for thank you, Dipanita, for this very interesting uh, webinar and uh, for talking uh, about reality and comics and um, you, you know writing the academic paper. Uh, the, the a small notification uh, for the audience uh, the department of english will be hosting more webinars weekly on topics 
like popular science writing, speculative fiction, and the new education policy. Please keep a lookout for updates on our social media handles, uh, SJC English the Literary Society, on Twitter and Facebook, and also our WhatsApp group. We will be updating um, with the details. So uh, these conversations will be re-uploaded on the department's YouTube channel. So um, you can go back and watch them whenever you want. Uh, Shivali, ma'am, if you would like to, uh, you know, say some final remarks. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm sorry if I didn't answer your questions properly. <laughs> I tried. Um, thank you for listening to me talk about something that's very strange and about realities that I don't know. I don't know if it makes sense to anyone apart from me, but thank you for listening. It's very sweet of you. Thank you. Also, the, in the comments, there was um, a person called Anand who was in, who was interested in children's fiction, and he was oh, asking he was asking if he could get in touch with you via email. So sure, sure. Uh, I can I can ask them to leave their email address in the chat, and then sure, sure. That sounds good. All right. So thank you everyone for coming uh, for watching our webinar, Causery, uh, the first of many. Um, we will be re-uploading re this video as well as uh, future videos. Uh, please do keep a uh, lookout for these videos in the channel. Subscribe to this channel. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you again. Good evening. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Bye. Bye. Uh, Linto, can you disconnect the stream? So.